Welcome to Al Ginkle, your virtual campfire talk with fellow eclectics, kindling knowledge synthesis. Welcome once again uh, to you, Brother Leslie. Thank you. Abdul Karim. Um, I hear your name popping up now from time to time on the <laughs> internet waves, uh, both uh, famously and infamously. Uh, sure. Mostly the former, because I don't travel in uh, those who label us infamously. <laughs> I don't travel those circles. I try to avoid them and i'm sure they try to avoid me uh, except when they're on the attack for whatever reason uh, uh, defensive measures uh, people feel they have to take um i i don't feel obliged to defend anything that i'm doing i just do it brother because it seems to be part of uh, the fit fitra allah that is uh, deposited in me and uh, I, I've made a, a few um, discoveries in some of the literature I've been reading this past week that uh, some of us agree to do these things before we're birthed, you see, before we're born. So I, I'm of the opinion that I don't have any choice other than to <laughs> pursue uh, the path which is set before me. And uh, I'm very honored that you are part of that uh, uh, endeavor, alhamdulillah. Now, where were we? Well, we started off several months ago, uh, following up your several uh, theses, if you will, about what went wrong with uh, the Muslim approach to jihad individually and collectively as a body of uh, how shall we say well I use the word believers because uh, uh, there is an awful lot of belief going around that is not exactly based on truth as we've been uh, revealing it slowly and steadily through these interviews now we were approaching uh, uh, the middle ages and uh, some aspects of the golden age but I, I thought we'd maybe take a step back before we get through that and approach the ottomans and um uh take a look at the madhabs remember we had talked about this two weeks ago i asked you to to look into it and to uh prepare a brief oral dissertation for the for the sake of our listeners because there are a lot of people who listen to folks like you and I, and they think they're informed, <clears throat> when in fact they're not, and they don't really come to appreciate the fact that they're not informed properly until they hear such interviews like this, just discussions between, you know, a couple of old fellows here sitting around a campfire and chewing the fat and trying to figure out, hey, what went wrong with our tribe? I mean, where did we, why did we miss that big mama bear? And, you know, we're trying to figure out what went wrong. Goodness me. And uh, I think that the uh, Mothops is part of that uh, errant, I suspect, I don't know, you know, from secondary and tertiary sources, because I'm an outsider. Uh, a, a brother by the name of Oloduso. You you might have met him when he was a research fellow back in the, back in the day at ISTAC. He's from uh, Nigeria, I believe he was. He wrote the introduction to my book, um, uh, The Cain's Creed. He said it was essential reading uh, for anyone who wants to understand the history of uh, the sort of global conspiracy that has become known as the new world order which is just the old world order updated to our modern experience anyway oloduso uh, said uh, look he said uh, it's like this you read dr o and you've got a pretty good advantage because he's he's neither on the inside or on the outside he's got a foot in both places and um 
uh, that allows a, a certain objective uh, perspective, which you're going to experience in these pages. And I was really honored to read that um, uh, introduction. He went on, on a little bit. But this idea that, you know, hey, I got one foot in and one foot out, but they're both firmly placed on the knowledge that I do have. And so I have these interviews with people like yourself to help me fill in the gaps, you see, along with uh, uh, others who are also interested in these same things. So let me tell you a little bit of what I think I know about the Mount Hobbs, and it's very little, believe me, okay? I think that the, these old, I'm, I'm surmising now, okay, based on what little I know of the Sikh and other things and uh, Islamic history, Muslim history, if you will. Uh, it seems to me that these fellows just uh, started out pretty much like you and I, uh, discussing this, that, and the next thing. And uh, they formed opinions. They weren't always in agreement, but they weren't at war with each other. Okay, that's my understanding of just a generic overview. And the wars or the competition, I, I'll use the, not war, I'll use competition, okay? Uh, the competition started with the students who set these things up. And, you know, two or three generations after you've got the original founders of these so-called madabs, uh, you have uh, uh, institutionalized oppositional parties, okay? It's like uh, they're all trying to take the front seat while they're on the back seat. Uh, I, you know, it's, if I if I can use that uh, analogy, it's just uh, it, there's a fierce competition, and uh, it didn't appear to be anything other than just uh, normal fishwifery, if you will. If I if can use that phrase, looking over the backyard and the fences, and uh, as the ladies are hanging out their laundry and they're they're saying this, that, and the next thing about so-and-so and such-and-such and, such and all this sort of thing. And I just thought, well, gosh, you know, this is kind of childish. And then I found out they still can't agree on how to pray 1,400 years later. And I say, well, gosh, that means they didn't know what they were talking about to begin with, you see. So uh, this is my impression, okay? Now, I know that most of our listeners never had that impression, okay? Because most of our listeners have both their feet in, inside the tradition. So there's a certain bias that uh, uh, the ability to, to see what I've just tried to explain in generic terms. So I know that's probably not the reality, but that's what impressed me. And so... Having said that, brother, what am I right about? What am I wrong about? What have I completely missed in my uh, brief and abbreviated <laughs> assessment, <laughs> inshallah? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, Brother Omar, uh, for that introduction and also for another opportunity to share some thoughts with your good self and uh, the viewers. Uh, before I begin, may I just take a moment or two of to my customary door? Yes, um, like when you said that, uh, uh, I'm wondering what uh, what I have missed. Well, I what I was thinking of that, I have been asking myself the same question actually. So, <clears throat> so there are mm -hmm. two of us here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, obviously, as a uh, I started out as a student of uh, political philosophy mm -hmm. when I was working with the friends of Leo Strauss uh, back at the University of Toronto. And don't get me wrong, they are the really outstanding scholars, and they have a very mm -hmm. very disciplined, focused approach. Uh, perhaps uh, there are some, uh, I have some differences in terms of the relationship between reason and revelation, because as I have mentioned <clears> before, <throat> they, they tend to draw a rather sharp distinction between the two. They refer to it as the uh, Jerusalem Athens, uh, you know, alternative. Uh, in mm. other words, they take the view that either you, you, you are religious and you accept uh, things on faith or else you are uh, following uh, some, uh, you are rational 
or you are yeah. rationalist in some sense or another. In other words, they saw these two uh, as somehow incompatible or, or, or mutually exclusive. So they sometimes, and others sometimes refer to it as the so-called tension between reason and revelation. Yes. And I hasten to add that when I use the word revelation, I mean what in uh, Arabic is uh, also rendered rendered as tanzil, which is rendered in English as that what which Allah has sent down. Now, mm-hmm. uh, the, another word which is the which is used for revelation is the term vahi, which is sometimes rendered as as inspiration. Now, we have to be careful to differentiate between uh, between the two because we know from the Quran that uh, Musa's mother received uh, vahi or inspiration when she was inspired to put the baby uh, Moses into the uh, basket or, or on the river. The bees in in the Quran have received inspiration uh, to build their uh, you know homes in uh, uh, places homes of the people the mm-hmm. earth will get wahi uh, you know inspiration on yamul kiyama and even zakaria uh, you know communicated to his uh, you know people using uh, wahi the, that's the word used using gestures to say that he could not speak to them and mm-hmm. also let us not forget that even some of the evil doers inspire each other as Allah informs us in the Quran you use a Quran using vahi so mm-hmm. inspiration can come from Allah and it can come from uh, you know people or to people or even from people and, and it can even come from some, some evil sources but that is never the case with tanzil revelation understood at tanzil everything mm-hmm. that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, you know uh, as tanzil is also inspiration, but not all inspiration is tanzil or revelation. I, I, ho- mm-hmm. I hope that makes it clear. Sure. So I, when I use the word revelation, I mean it in a sense uh, closer to, I'm in a sense of tanzil rather than uh, what we normally think of as inspiration. Of course. So now, <clears throat> now coming back to the the idea of what what have i missed uh, i suppose you 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 know a little bit of my background i grew up mm-hmm. under communism and we had a certain worldview and ideology and we had good guys there in the classrooms uh, pictures of karl marx the president engels or whoever was mm-hmm. you know the this the, this this yes, uh, you know course. priests or whatever you want to call them of the religion called communism because in a way mm-hmm. it is all was also and of course when I migrated to Canada those names were taken off the walls and instead now we have people like Churchill our prime minister and a different uh, a mm-hmm. bunch of yes. folks takes takes the place mm-hmm. so the, then I came to Malaysia and again uh, I had to take some p- pictures down and put up others up there now we have uh, the different people up there on the wall so I was wondering what's going on here I mean uh, uh, th- th- there are so many different orientations and worldviews that are competing ideologies that are all competing with one another for the allegiance of man and of course mm-hmm. we have Islam I don't want to call it an ideology but it's a way of life the word Deen uh, translates also uh, roughly uh, into a uh, way of life as the yeah. chap that uh, interviewed me for my job at the Islamic Science University in Malaysia mm-hmm. uh, put it in uh, in his book, uh, which I have read, uh, the professor, do I need to mention his name? Perhaps that's not necessary, but a fine gentleman with the first degree mm-hmm. from Medina and a PhD from, from uh, one of the UK universities. Mm-hmm. So now, of course, uh, you know, uh, even in the Western tradition, we have this concept of, uh, you know, uh, so-called false consciousness, right? And mm-hmm. uh, several people have touched on this issue. It's very important in political theory, for example. Karl Marx had uh, had his own notion of a false consciousness where where the, the workers think that they are well off by serving their masters, uh, the capitalists, mm-hmm. and, and they think, and uh, also uh, some people have tried to, you know, justify uh, the issue of uh, practice of slavery as uh, thinking, uh, saying that, well, some, some people like to be uh, in that condition. They they don't like freedom Mm -hmm. and in fact one of the uh, leaders uh, independence leaders I think in in South Africa I don't recall exactly whether it was uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu or was it Mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela uh, said that you know we we had a choice you know between freedom and lunch 
So mm -hmm. if we chose freedom, uh, we might lose our rice bowl, our lunch. But if we mm -hmm. if we continue with our job, our rice bowl, then we will have lunch, but we may not have freedom. So th there are these trade offs that perhaps mm -hmm. uh, sometimes need to, to to be made, and people fight yeah, indeed for freedom, like the Second World War was in some ways uh, a fight uh, over freedom, uh, freedom uh, represented by the Allies and fascism or tyranny represented by the Nazi uh, Axis powers, you see. So mm -hmm. luckily, thank God, the the supporters of freedom prevailed over the supporters of tyranny and the, uh, the so-called Ubermensch or the Overmen, as they call themselves, were defeated by the so-called Undermen or the Untermensch. Mm -hmm. In other words, Allah turned the tables on them. And by the way, this ideology, the so-called master-slave dialectic, was worked out by George Friedrich Hegel in his Phenomenology of the Spirit, which is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a classic articulation of how history progresses through a series of conflicts between, uh, I mean, from a theoretical point of view, we can think of it as a conflict between theses, antithesis and synthesis so yes. that for example when when uh, you know the french revolutionaries challenged the ancient regime uh, the french revolutionaries the, the followers of reason or the enlightenment if you like they were the the, the uh, antithesis against the thesis represented by the monarchy mm -hmm. so there was a conflict called the french revolution and uh, after after this conflict emerged a synthesis in the form of napoleon bonaparte who somehow retained elements of both. He yes. was the emperor, so that was the, he retained that from the ancien regime. And but he also believed in equality and and, and human rights, what have you, rule of law. And, and so, in that sense, he incorporated elements of, of of the antithesis. And by the way, I have found out recently that when Napoleon was sailing to Egypt, uh, he read the Quran on the boat while he was yes. sailing there. Mm -hmm. and, and towards the end of his life, he's, he wrote some very positive things about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him. Mm -hmm. So he was quite interested, actually, in Islam, and he wasn't alone. Immanuel Kant, uh, you know, uh, the German philosopher of reason, uh, the author of the brilliant uh, Critique of Pure Reason, also apparently had written uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in Arabic on, uh, I think it was, was it the invitation to, to some kind of dinner, or was it... Uh, some kind of an award certificate. I don't recall that exactly. Mm -hmm. But what I am trying to say is that there was considerable interest among educated Europeans in, in Islam already back in those days. Mm -hmm. So now, having said all that, uh, in terms of uh, what went wrong, uh, of course, we have done uh, analysis of World War II, has been done extensively, Napoleon, okay. What went wrong in his case? Well, he shouldn't have aggressed. You invaded Russia. That was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Allah does not love aggressors, you see. So if he had yes. managed to stay away from that, maybe he would have lasted longer, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So now, but what about our Ummah? Uh, as you know, uh, is also currently many people have noted, including people, uh, Sunni scholars like, that they are sometimes referred to as neo-traditionalist Sunni scholars. I'm referring mm -hmm. to Nahajabi Rawani, the former chairperson of the IIIT Institute in Herndon, Virginia, USA, the International Institute of Islamic Thought, then his colleague, uh, Alwani was originally a scholar of uh, Iraqi background, Al-Azhar PhD graduate, and mm -hmm. then his colleague, uh, Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, uh, the second rector of the International Islamic University here in Malaysia, also both wrote some, I think, very remarkable books. I may not agree with everything they write, but 90, 80, 90, let's say make it 85% of what they write, I can agree with. Mm -hmm. And they both note that the condition of the Ummah is dire. There's something went wrong, definitely, and they are trying to analyze what it is. Yes. And according to uh, Abu Habid Abu Sulaiman, in a book translated and into English and published in 1993, the mm -hmm. main problem was began in the mind. The, the, he titled his book "The Crisis in the Muslim Mind." Excellent book, mm -hmm. excellent reading. I have mm -hmm. a sort of a abridged version of it on Academia with a little introduction, but mm -hmm. the, the full text is available online in the English language uh, in PDF format. You can download uh, an excellent copy directly from the triple it dot 
ORG Institute. And then he followed up that book, uh, in published 1993, with another book, excellent book, called uh, Re uh, Retrieving the Islamic Worldview, I believe is the title, that was published in 2011. And here he goes a step further and comes closer, in fact, to Tahajah Berawani, where when he, they both basically uh, come, are coming to the agreement that what went wrong was that the Sunnah, uh, or the hadith, if you we, we use the, those expressions the way that Al Shafi used them, because to Al Shafi mm -hmm. the Sunnah was pretty much uh, the same as the hadith. The Sunnah, after all, is based on the hadith. So both of these uh, neo traditionalist scholars, Abu Sulaiman and Taha Jabir al Wani, basically agree that what went wrong was that the Sunnah has somehow overshadowed the Quran and become so prominent uh, 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 at the expense of the Quran that um, Taha Jabir al Wani even goes so far as to say that the Ummah, and this is verbatim, I quote, abandoned the Quran almost entirely, end of quote, almost entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous verse in Al Quran, Surah 25, verse number 30, where Allah Himself says that the Prophet Muhammad will say on Yaumul Qiyamah, Oh my Lord, my people have uh, are treating this Quran as a, something to be uh, rejected or abandoned. So yes. Allah Himself predicts that there will be a turning away from the Quran towards yes. something else and that kind of like a change in Qibla if you like yes. a change of direction, a change of focus away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet peace be on him. Now what do we make of this? Is this yes. a correct diagnosis of what went wrong? Mm. Be because this momentous change was uh, partly triggered by uh, the emergence of the Hadith uh, which started in the 700s, and um, also it was partly triggered, triggered by conflicts that began to develop between the mazhabs, as you were saying, we are now coming to the madhahib, about mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, best way to, to understand the Book of Allah. The so-called uh, Ahlil al-Rai, or the people of opinion, represented by uh, Abu Hanifa, argued in favor of, uh, you know, uh, using uh, reason, rationalism, and Abu Hanifa, according to a book by Daniel Brown called uh, Rethinking Tradition uh, in Modern Islamic Thought, Abu Hanifa would only accept, he didn't reject all the hadiths, but he, but he would only accept verbatim hadiths as yes. reliable. In other words, the hadiths had to be the exact words of the Prophet not paraphrases, as actually, if I'm not mistaken, practically all, if uh, I, w I would think all the hadiths actually are paraphrases. There is not a, not a single <clears throat> verbatim hadith, except, of course, for the best hadith, which is, which is the Quran itself. So the Book of Allah refers to itself as the best hadith, Ahsanul yes. hadith, and also it presents itself as the best tafsir, Ahsanul tafsir. So mm -hmm. these are arguments that are often used by uh, Ahlil Quran or people who follow the Quran only, which, by the way, the Prophet himself also did, I would like to emphasize. So that people who think that the followers of Quran only are somehow deviating from uh, Islam, uh, they should remember that the Prophet himself <clears throat> followed only the Quran. He certainly mm -hmm. did not follow Bukhari, Nasai, Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, or any of the other compilers of the traditions. He never even heard of them. And mm -hmm. we are advised, and he was advised in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to pursue that of which he had no, uh, had no knowledge. So mm -hmm. if the Prophet himself had no knowledge of these hadith books, by the way, I'm not rejecting them out of hand. I still make a, a allowance for them to be used for purposes of getting some information about the past, but of definitely course. not as legislation, definitely not as binding, and definitely mm -hmm. not as explaining the Quran, and definitely not as equal to or even superior in some ways uh, to the Quran. Yes. I was astonished to to hear brother uh, doctor, you know, uh, from uh, Georgetown University, uh, Jonathan Brown, say in one video that the Hadith, the Sunnah, is more powerful than the Quran. I was absolutely shocked. Well, how can he? possibly make such a statement. Mm -hmm. When yeah. Allah says that if this Quran had been uh, revealed onto a mountain, the mountain would crumble. Yet here Dr. Brown is telling us that the Sunnah <clears throat> is 
basically a collection of hearsay, I'm sorry for being so blunt, he's telling us that this uh, collection of hearsay, which would not be accepted as evidence even in an ordinary court of law, yes. let alone a Sharia court, uh, the, the ulama have made this hearsay into a second source of legislation. This is absolutely yeah. shocking. And yeah, I'm, not, I'm not alone. Even Tahajabir al-Wani expresses reservations. And he states in his book, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Reviving the Balance, that Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only lawgiver in matters of religion. There, There is no second source, so to speak. And even Ijma is uh, very problematic to say that consensus of the scholars can be uh, a source of the law. Similarly, for uh, mm -hmm. analogy, analogical reasoning is not a source of the law. It could be at best understood as a methodology of arriving at some rulings. Yes. Mm -hmm. For example, to outlaw riba al-fadl, which is the riba of excess, which is reported uh, on in the Hadith corpus. It, it, the riba al-fadl is not mentioned in the Quran. The riba that the Quran mentions is <clears throat> riba al-nasiyah, uh, the riba or interest or usury that is attached, uh, the increase that is attached on to loans when they are being repaid. So since, since the principle of riba is the same in both cases, which is the inequality of the counter values exchanged, then the prophet can apply through analogical reasoning, the prohibition of uh, riba from the Quran, which applied to loans, also to a prohibition of riba in sales transactions. Because mm -hmm. the illa, the cause of the prohibition, is the same in both cases. It is the inequality of the counter values exchanged, and be because <clears throat> this inequality actually uh, represents injustice. And that is why the riba is prohibited, because it is a form mm -hmm. of injustice and, and exploitation. Yeah, so now. Yeah, so now to come back to, to the madahib, I did notice one, uh, 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 only a matter of days ago, that uh, mm -hmm. I, I, something that struck me as a pattern. So let me try it out and uh, maybe you can tell me if you can see anything okay. wrong with this argument. <laughs> so far I have not been able to find any, any major holes in it, but you never know, there might be some, but I noticed mm -hmm. As I was, uh, you know, actually I'm trying to complete another book and I have a section there mm -hmm. called uh, The Battle of the Books and I touch on the, the, the uh, you know, imams. And by the way, I'd like to add, if I may just add, I should probably add a footnote to what I was uh, mentioning yes. earlier in terms of the tension between the two groups, uh, between the so-called Ahlil al-Rai, the people of opinion, mm -hmm. and the Ahlil Hadith. Actually, this was another sort of um, thought that, uh, you know, uh, I, I uh, somehow, I don't know, how do I describe it, pop into my brain or, but it, it occurred to me that, you know, uh, when I was reading, uh, you know, uh, the account of Imam al Shafi struggling against his opponents, he does not, it seems, identify his opponents as the Ahlil al Rai. No, mm -hmm. he identifies them by a different name. And that other name is Mutakallimun, the theologians. And who were the theologians? Well, they were the Ahlil Kalam. And what does Kalam mean here? Well, the Kalam here means the word of Allah, the book of Allah, in other words, the Quran. So mm -hmm. his dispute was actually, let me, how do I put this? Let me put it this way. Uh, let me put it cautiously. His dispute was, let's say, as much with the Ahlil al rai the followers of Abu Hanifa, as it was, or can I be a little bolder and say, it seems to me that his dispute was more with the, the Ahlil Kalam than with the Ahlil al rai In other mm. words, the real dispute here was not so much a dispute between the followers of, of opinion, which is, uh, and, and the followers of the Hadith of tradition, which is the account that we get from Taj Abir Awani, for example. He puts mm -hmm. the, the tension, the struggle in those terms. But perhaps the tension is better understood as a tension or a, a clash, if you like, between uh, not the people of opinion and the people of the tradition, but rather the people, uh, the Ahlil, uh, Ahlil uh, Quran or the Ahlil Kalam and the the followers of tradition. In other words, 
what, what, what the, the real tension was between the followers of the Quran and the followers of the Hadith. Let me put yes. it very, very directly. And if this is the case, that would be quite significant because then the, the followers of the Hadith traditions, they have some more explaining to do than we have, uh, you know, uh, been led to believe. They have to explain to us why is it that you are struggling against the people of the Quran? Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, why? there was exactly, exactly. why, well, well, how, well, how, where do you get the audacity to struggle against people who are following the Quran, just mm -hmm. like the prophet himself, peace be on him, did? W w what is your rationale? Please explain mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. So th that's one point I wanted to highlight. And in, in fact, there was a fellow I was watching one of his videos earlier. Uh, saying that in uh, Hadith number 250, I think, was it even Maja, the Prophet refers to uh, the people closest to Allah as Ahlil Quran. So this expression is encountered in the Hadith corpus. Mm -hmm. so, but but uh, the, the, the expression, uh, now what about the expression uh, Ahlil Hadith? Ahlil Sunnah is not mentioned in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And even the Sunnah of the Prophet is not mentioned in the Quran. Now, I take the view that uh, I still believe that, yes, the Prophet did have a Sunnah, but it is not what we hear from our Sunni, uh, Sunni brothers and sisters. Yes. The Sunnah of the Prophet was plain and simple to follow the Quran, to follow the mm -hmm. Book of Allah, which is what he was commanded to do. He was commanded to recite the Quran and to follow it. Mm -hmm. And the explanation was up to Allah, Allah al Quran, uh, Surah 55, I think, uh, verse number two. Then also, verse 19 in Surah 75, Kiyama Allah says, Inna alayna bayana, it is on us to explain it. Now, yes. interestingly, perhaps I can mention this uh, without intending any malice, that when uh, Tajabir al Wani was trying to make his case, because he believes that the Sunnah helps to elucidate, he uses the word elucidate, and sometimes he uses the word clarify the Quran. When he was trying to make his case, he interestingly quoted uh, Surah 75, the one I mentioned, and he quoted verses 16, 17, and 18, but then he stopped short and did not quote verse number 19, where Allah says, in Allah Nabayana, it is on us to um, uh, explain it, now, mm -hmm. why didn't the Professor Alwani quote that verse? Well, if he wanted to be less than charitable, you might say that he didn't quote it because it would have undermined his whole case of yes. postulating the Sunnah as mm -hmm. something that explains the Quran. Now, how yes, did that yes. happen? You know, I think when we deal with people's arguments, we, we have to present the opponent's argument in the strongest possible way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we even have to help him or her to, to make the argument better and not uh, somehow weaken it by uh, leaving out a, a very important uh, part of the argument that would, uh, you know, make his, uh, the, uh, the other party's argument much more credible and strong. For mm -hmm. some reason, Professor Alwani uh, refrained from referring to that verse. I was quite disappointed, really, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But of course... I'm not going to ascribe him any, any uh, you know, evil motives, but it was, I think, a significant oversight on his part, I have to say. By the way, this happens on page 75 in the book called uh, Reviving the Balance. I remember the page number because it's the same number as the surah to which he was referring to, so that is easy to remember. So those mm -hmm. readers who, who want to check whether what I'm saying is actually, you know, co concurs with reality, please go ahead, be my guest. and. And, and I challenge them too to to find any holes or gaps in my arguments. I am ready to be corrected. Obviously, mm -hmm. we, we, this is all work yeah. in progress for us. But now to come to the second uh, sort of insight uh, that I was mentioning, that uh, I only realized uh, I thought of this just a matter of days ago. I, I not, when I was looking over these mother mother hibs, I realized that hey, wait a minute, there seems to be a pattern here. Uh, we have four four imams. We have uh, Abu Hanifa, born in 699 uh, and uh, died in 767, the same year as Imam al Shafi was born. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, <clears throat> then we have uh, after Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, we have Imam al Malik, uh, and then we have uh, Shafi, and then finally we have Ibn Hanbal. 
And there seems to be a change uh, that takes place in the work of these uh, imams as you move, as time goes by. Imam mm -hmm. Abu Hanifa seems to have been the most stringent in his requirement uh, in how he looked at the, the hadith, the traditions. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, they had to be verbatim, the exact words of the Prophet, in mm -hmm. order for him to consider them seriously. In other yes. words, he would not accept paraphrase or transmission by meaning. The Arabic word is ma'na. That was not good enough for him. So now, and by the way, he had this in common with the Ahlil Quran, also rejected hadith as unreliable. Actually, they rejected all the hadith. They wouldn't even accept, I, I think, the, uh, the uh, 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 verbatim hadith. So mm -hmm. now, now comes uh, Imam al-Malik, who was, by the way, uh, Imam al shafis teacher, as you may know. And he uh, actually started the first collection of hadith, which I, I think we, we did not mention it in our last discussion, but better late than never. His, the name of his collection is called the Muwatta of Imam al-Malik, and that was apparently the, the first collection but apparently this collection was not recommended by people like Al Shafi to be included in the so-called six major books of Hadith, right? It is not among them. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, some people claim that he was leaning towards the Quran a little bit like Abu Hanifa uh, or quite a bit perhaps. That's a that this is a matter of interpretation. But could we possibly, you know, uh, put both Imam Abu Hanifa and uh, Imam Al Malik uh, on the one side and and say, well, they were. I'm not saying that they were purely Ahlul Quran, but they had a, you know, certainly a preference uh, for for the Quran. And of course, Imam Malik, as we noted last time, he would sometimes follow the tradition of the people of Medina in in preference to some of the ideas. Now, next comes uh, Imam al Shafi, who opened the door uh, more widely to the Hadith, and he would uh, not only make the, uh, the, accept the uh, Hadith transmitted in paraphrase, in other words, by meaning, he did not insist that the Hadith had to be verbatim like Abu Hanifa did. Mm -hmm. He need, didn't only accept uh, Hadith in paraphrase or transmitted by meaning, he even made the Hadith into a second source of law. Now, that is a big, big step. He introduced what is known as the concept of dual revelation, Vahi Ain. And um, as I was saying earlier, if by revelation you mean only inspiration, uh, perhaps uh, you could, uh, you know, treat the Hadith as something that was inspired, but not in the sense that it was sent down like Tanzil. By the way, Aisha Musa has a paper on academia on the concept of dual revelation, Vahi Ain, as it is called. I think the, the, the uh, shall I say, mistake of the ulama was not so much that they, uh, you know, incorporated the Hadith corpus into the general body uh, of uh, the heritage of Islam, but the, the mistake was in how they did it, you see. Mm -hmm. The moment that they began to treat the Hadith, okay, you could still say the Hadith is revelation of some sort, so in, in the sense of inspiration, but not sent down by Allah, not as Tanzil. Mm -hmm. But when they declared that the Hadith is equal to the Book of Allah, that, mm -hmm. that's where they, I believe, personally, they crossed the red line. That was a no-no. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and they justified crossing this red line by... I think, fabricating a hadith, according to which the Prophet allegedly said that, I quote, I was given two things, the Quran and something equal to it, yeah. the hadith, end of quote. That mm -hmm. is how the quotation is found, I quoted it verbatim on Ibn mm -hmm. Ba's website, as, as the chief cleric of Saudi Arabia uh, at that time, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So, so that was the mistake, to, to treat the hadith uh, as equal to the Quran, and actually they didn't stop there, as we have discussed before, they, yeah. they even elevated it above the Quran. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, you're saying that Hanifa was the first one to do this? No, 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 I, Imam al-Shafi was the first one to Shafi. do this. Shafi, oh, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Not, not, I not still get confused with these names. Shafi, okay, yeah, he Shafi was the first was one. The first. He was the Correct. first one to elevate the yeah. Hadith to a, a dual uh, relationship. Correct. Correct, with correct. Uh, with the Quran and yes, maybe absolutely. even above 
Oh, yes, gosh. correct, correct. Because okay. even though he says in his mm. Risala that uh, only the Quran can abrogate the Quran, which is a mistake already, mm. uh, there is no abrogation in the Quran by the Quran, yes, or and, and that he also claims that only the Hadith can abrogate Hadith. Yet, if you look at his acceptance of the Hadith on stoning to death for adultery or the death penalty for apostasy, mm. you can see clearly that he is departing from his own rule and he is mm. allowing the Hadith to abrogate uh, the Quranic verses, which is another major significant let's call it for a, a yeah. blunder on, on his part so, I would say well, Sorry let's if I'm... put this in perspective yeah, if, go ahead. if you may if go I ahead. may um, yeah. uh, according to your knowledge uh, which is the largest uh, matab Hanafi matab is the largest correct the Hanafi yeah correct okay. so second largest uh, would be the uh, Shafi I think the Shafi okay so that's kind of the Muslim world is kind of split in half, and they don't even realize what they're yeah. split over. Yeah, right. If I, so if now, I, yeah, yeah. I, I've had several conversations with people. They don't actually understand what's taking place here. With, yeah, with, with how you're putting it in yeah. perspective, right. with the right. hadith eclipsing. You see, yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. the Al Quran. Yeah, it's amazing. So, yeah, okay. yeah just to finish the, the analysis, now sure. come, we come to what we have seen here is that Imam al Shafi uh, treats the hadith more liberally, if I can use that word, than Abu Hanifa. Okay. You see, so now we come to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so let, let, me, let, me, let me redo that. Imam mm -hmm. al Malik, um, uh, the strictest is Abu Hanifa when it comes to treating the Hadith. He has the highest standards. The Hadith must yes. be verbatim, otherwise he won't accept mm -hmm. it. Now, okay. Imam Malik accepted even Hadiths that, uh, you know, uh, were uh, not verbatim, but he sometimes prioritized the, the custom of the people of Medina. Mm -hmm. Now, here comes Shafi, the third Imam, and he uh, opens the door even more widely to the Hadith mm. uh, by uh, now designating it as a second sort of a source of the Sharia of, of Islamic law. Mm -hmm. But now we have one more Imam after him, you see, yes. Imam Ibn Hanbal, who uh, was uh, died in 855 and was born, I think, in 780. So he comes at the end of these four, uh, four Imams. And interestingly, he is very much against reason and rationality. So mm -hmm. much so that not only he does not, uh, you know, permit the use of aql or reason to understand uh, revelation, he even applies this rule to understanding of the hadith. Mm -hmm. He so uh, so he puts the greatest emphasis on hadith at the expense of reason. Mm -hmm. While with when we began with Imam Abu Hanifa, he placed a great deal of emphasis on the reason and very little emphasis on hadith. So mm. what we see here is a kind of change in the relationship between reason and tradition. Yes, yeah, almost reason. 180 degrees. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. Abu Hanifa, known as a rationalist, uh, one of the Ahlil Rai, sees mm. a major role for reason in understanding, interpreting and applying revelation, the Book of Allah. Mm -hmm. Then comes Imam uh, Malik, who opens the door a little bit wider to the Hadith than Abu yeah. Hanif. It, then comes Imam al Shafi, who opens the door even more widely to the Hadith. And then comes Imam Ibn Hanbal, who shuts the door to reason. And now Hadith becomes really very, very prominent. So what we see here is a gradual, and by the way, these people lived uh, within a 150 year period, you see. Yes, uh, yes. Imam uh, uh, Abu Hanifa was born 699. Uh, Imam Ibn Hanbal died in 855. That's 156 mm -hmm. year, uh, years later. Yes, the first yes. two Imams actually were contemporaries. They lived mm -hmm. uh, for a while together uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. And the last three Imams also were contemporaries for a while, you see. So it, it was a very small world. And by the way, with this growing emphasis on tradition and hadith and this bias developing against the reason and rationalism and rationalists, guess what happened in 786 when Imam uh, Shafi was only 19 years old? Do you remember that great slaughter of the philosophers? 5, yes, yes, yes. Ah, that's what happened exactly in the middle of this process where reason was being displaced and perhaps replaced by tradition, you see. Uh-huh. Oh, mass murder. 
you know, yeah, okay. well, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's probably some connection here, but we can we can come back to that uh, yeah. Yeah. another okay. time. What I'm trying so, to Han, point out, yeah, if I ahead. understand you correctly, I, I'm sorry for for butting That's in, right. but if no I problem. understand you correctly, and I'm doing this for the sake of our listeners, listeners, Hanbali and and my own understanding, Hanbal, Hanbal, even on Hanbal, became the first uh, died in the wool traditionalist if you will yes absolutely i mean oh, okay. he he wouldn't eat watermelon just because the prophet never ate watermelon that doesn't like yes, seem like yes, a very reasonable right, approach right. Mm -hmm. but so there's a tendency here anti-rationalism is growing and mm -hmm. uh, sorry yes anti-rationalism growing and as mm -hmm. traditionalism is also rising so reason is being suppressed and tradition is being elevated and that's mm -hmm. how we get the so-called subordination of akal to knuckle the subordination mm -hmm. of the intellect or rationality to tradition the yes. traditional scholars basically claim that we have to follow even the weakest hadith and even if it is goes against uh, how do I put this? To borrow the words of my former mentor, uh, Professor no, Mohammed Kamali, he says <laughs> they, that that scholar said that we have to follow uh, uh, hadith, even when I quote, it goes against the dictates of reason. End of quote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in other words, we have to throw reason, rationality under the bus. We go with the hadith. And Allah now, gave us reason. Yeah. Exactly. So this is completely anti-Quran and goes against yeah, the Quran because Allah says Afala mm -hmm. uh, Allah talks a lot about uh, uh, tafakkur, reflecting, tadabur, meditating. Allah yeah. says in verse 100, Surah number 10, that He will place ridges or confusion or filth on the people who don't use their reason. He refers yeah. to the people who don't use their reason in Surah 8, verse 22, as the worst of creatures, the worst yes. of creatures. Mm -hmm. So despite all these uh, admonitions to use our reason, the scholars are telling us exactly the opposite. Now, mm -hmm. what do you make of that? I think this is that's one of the things that went wrong, seriously yeah. wrong. So mm. how can you follow something you do not understand? How can you follow yeah. the Quran if you are not prepared to use your mind, your brain to understand it? Yet this is what yeah. the traditional you know, ulama is saying. But exactly. there's a couple more thing, couple more things that happen. You see, mm -hmm. for a time uh, from 809 until uh, 852, I think the rationalists got the upper hand under Al Ma'mun and some of his family, and uh, the rationalists were in a saddle, so to speak. And that was the time that they, uh, starting with uh, Rash, uh, Harun al-Rashid, they started the Al-Baitul Hikmah, they translated works from foreign uh, languages into, you know, that was the so-called Islamic Golden Age. While the Muslim Ummah was rational or rationalistic, that was the Golden Age of Islam. So, mm -hmm. But that changed in 852 when Mutawakil reversed the policy of the rationalists and put the traditionalists back in the saddle. So now mm -hmm. the entire process of the persecution of rationalists was uh, restarted, uh, resumed, and uh, uh, thinkers were once again chased out of their homes, sometimes killed, their books were burned. And about 150 years later, at the turn of the millennium, even the gates to Ijtihad or the uh, license to you know, issue fatwas by the scholars, even that was officially prohibited by one of the caliphs. In other words, what we have witnessed here is a complete shutdown of the Muslim mind, the closing mm -hmm. of the Muslim mind, officially closed by po mm -hmm. political decree. And then, as if that was not enough, comes uh, Imam al-Ghazali a hundred years later and he puts a final nail in the coffin of rationalism by writing mm -hmm. his critique of the philosophers, the mm -hmm. Tahafud, uh, mm -hmm. where he identifies philosophers with, uh, you know, atheists and then recommends the death penalty basically for them. So what we are seeing here, the long-term trend is away from rationalism towards uh, traditionalism and um, and uh, uh, towards the hadith towards uh, traditionalism and i would even think uh, the, the, and also with the the decrease on, of the emphasis on rationalism there's also a decrease of emphasis on the quran and increasing mm -hmm. emphasis on the hadith you see so there's mm -hmm. a gradual yeah. movement away 
from both reason and revelation understood as the Quran. And in favor of tradition is becoming more and more bigger and bigger and, and uh, more and more prominent. According to Taha Jabir Rawani, actually, uh, the, the, the uh, way the scholars justified focusing on the Sunnah was by saying, well, but, but the Sunnah includes the Quran, so there's no need to refer to the, 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 the Quran. And there's a scholar in the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates, he wrote a couple of papers, you can find them online. His name is uh, Sultan, Buddhi Sultan Ali al Muhairi, and the name of the paper is called uh, Sharia in the United Arab Emirates, a modern and pre-modern period. There are two there are two papers, and in one of the papers he says that basically the the ulama have relegated what they considered before the, to be the primary sources, although I believe there's only one primary source, the Quran. What they considered to be the primary sources into uh, remote sources, they became remote, and for all practical purposes, their their prime uh, the, the works of the scholars, the, their predecessors became their uh, you know primary reference. They were in fact prohibited from referring to the primary sources. So what I'm trying the conclusion that I want to sort of crown all this uh, with, mm -hmm. I, I want to use a strong word, and but please correct me if you think it is too too strong. But I think what we are witnessing here is not just a mere uh, you know, assault on reason, a departure or drifting from uh, the Book of Allah, the, uh, from Revelation, and not merely uh, a rise in the importance of tradition. And by the way, the, the Quran tells us very clearly not to follow the traditions of our forefathers, and that is exactly what the Ummah uh, did when they abandoned the Quran in favor of the traditions. Yes, but we are witnessing, mm -hmm. let me put it cautiously, we may be witnessing something even worse than all this, which is, can I say, a rise of fanaticism? What do you yes. think, brother? Thank you. Well, it, it's, it, it's an extreme position uh, because uh, on the one hand, you, you have the, 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 the right brained approach and you have the left brained approach but uh, the there's a there's a third third approach brother if i may ah, just in, yeah, the okay. no brain the no brain approach. the no brain approach <laughs> okay no brain well, i i'm i'm being uh, yeah, generous yeah. Kind because you know, if yeah. you get if you get struck on one extreme or the other let's say if you have the right brain approach then you become a sufi extremist if you have the left brain approach then you become the uh, the arabist uh, uh, extremist yeah. who's sunnah only you know and but the, you know islam is the middle path so every time you get to one end or the other you should pause and tough a core and then come back to the middle you see and this is an ongoing process this this swinging back and forth from right to left and we use this politically speaking at the right you know and the left and you know, the aisles aren't supposed to meet, but every time they have a quiet soiree uh, behind closed doors, the Republicans and the Democrats or the Tories and the Labour, they're, they're meeting and saying, hey, well, that propaganda program worked well. What are we going to do next? You see, as they're chugging down their champagne. Uh, this is the same thing happened to Islam, it seemed to me. So it is a form of extremists and it's a form of politicizing a, a, a religion, if you will, and uh, keeping people divided as opposed to unified. And that's what we're getting at here. That's why I say, okay, well, let's pursue this matab again next week because I think that they were intelligently used to keep the people divided on either side of the Sufi Shia divide, if you will, and um, either side of this uh, fundamentalist uh, versus Sufi, you know, see, uh, uh, divide. Uh, I meant to say Sunnah Shia divide. Um, <clears throat> so this division is not a unity. It's not Tawheed. It, it prevents Tawheed. It prevents uh, Tawheed because it prevents the use of reason. And either way, you see, whether you're right-brained or left-brained here in your approach to uh, the deen, according to these religious uh, mis misunderstandings, okay, you, you're becoming tuckly, this, you're just blind following the traditions, and that's what we're getting at here, and I want to thank you uh, for making that, again, abundantly clear that this is what happened, because many of our young listeners, they need to understand this, 
from an academic, historical, and philosophical evolutionary process, because that's what took place. So here's where sociopolitical biases uh, turn people into top lead uh, traditionalists, whether of the right or of the left, because what they're doing, what you said here is very important. And I saw this when I, I walked into many a Sufi tariqat, you see, they, they have a they have this, you know, sort of center like you have in the, in the, in in the, um, uh, the places of prayer where there's an empty spot, you know, supposed to represent the prophet once stood there, but they also have the picture of their leaders. You see, their their uh, master, the one who's sitting on the diet, and when they do their devotions, they're bowing also to his picture, which is a kind of idolatry. So what you've just described here is idolatry, or even on the part of the uh, Sunnis, you know, who have abandoned Sufism for, for uh, to greater or lesser degrees, some of them, and uh, have accepted this fundamentalist, taqlidist approach to elevating the tradition above the Quran. And so they don't look at the Quran, or if they do, it's just the <clears throat> formality of recitation. You see, without comprehension. And I met so many of them, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. Uh, but they replace this with an image in their mind of their Madhav leader. No, I don't think the Madhav leaders had this in mind when they entered the grave. So I don't think the death angel was uh, inquiring about that. But I think this is something that happened to their students. And I would like to explore that uh later because in the establishment of any religion no matter what it is all over the world this has consistently happened and it consistently happened on the, the grand scale and also the macro scale <clears throat> and the micro scale okay so if we just look at the matabs okay well there there's some com competitions okay right? there's nothing wrong with that you, you have a little bit of opposition and you you get pushed against and then you have to understand well what are you pushing for i mean if you're going to stand your ground that's okay there's nothing wrong with competition but the whole point of competition is to get to a point where we agree upon the perceived truth what it is that we're able to perceive of it I mean, look, this new telescope just went up and it's taking another look at the, uh, the skies and uh, oh, lo and behold, what they predicted would never happen. This discovery has happened. And this discovery recently has destroyed the Big Bang theory, which makes the Big Bang obsolete. It doesn't mean make any other observations obsolete, but that Big Bang was a hypothesis. Now it's destroyed because of this new uh, telescope that's gone up. So I think that's wonderful. And we're trying to do the same thing here. Okay, well, we're gonna destroy all these hypothetical positions and uh, let's get to the reality. And what is the reality? Well, the reality is only what we can see, see? So we couldn't see beyond the Huddle's uh, telescope, you know, that was sent up 20 years ago. Now, now we can see a new one and gosh, because we can actually see it, it changes our whole perspective, you see. And then, you know, this hypothesis, which has been held as sacred for so long by so many previous uh, astrophysicists, is done away with. And they, they're speechless, you see. They don't know what to say. Well, the Sunnis, uh, who uh, are genuinely uh, interested in the truth, they should also become speechless in the face of what we're discussing here and they should say oh my god is that what really happened well gosh we have to change our hypotheses then that means that what we were believing just because we were told <clears throat> by somebody we don't know you see is hey that's where it starts <clears throat> I saw this in a Sufi uh, uh, textbook, one of these uh, coffee table books, hardbound, big one, oversized, you know. I was sitting in the house of uh, a member of the royal family in uh, Kuala Lumpur, and uh, he uh, went to um, answer the phone, and I'm 
staying sitting in his living room and there's this big coffee table book there so i opened it up and it's about his tarikat and uh, the history well they couldn't trace the history any further back than 200 years after the death of our prophet and uh, so what they then they said well well the beginning of this tarikat was the result of a vision that somebody had during a dream where they met so and so in the dream and he said you start this tarikat this is the real inspiration we're going to sort everything out here and i said well jesus this I've seen these same stories in the histories of other cults, you know, doing the same thing. It all starts with some dream and vision of some stranger who says he's so-and-so, when in fact, you have no evidence for that. You know, because uh, these other unseen creatures, you know, they can mess with your visions and dreams and, and give you a misdirection, and you'll think it's holy. You'll think it's sacred, you see. And so the Madhabs, have been taken as a sacred position. And this tradition has been taken as a sacred tradition. And it's not sacred. It's a expression of humanism is what it is, because these individuals have set themselves and their sayings and their opinions above Al Quran. See, and all based on hearsay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Well, I want to thank you very much, brother, and I want to continue this. So please, whatever you're reading on these madhabs and whatever you discuss, discover, please uh, bring it to the table when we meet again, inshallah, that will be next week. Anything you'd like to add, brother? Yeah, just a footnote about how the Hadith collection actually started. I, I had intended to mention this earlier, uh, yes. but uh, what I wanted to say, what I would like to say is that Many people don't realize, including myself until quite recently, that the first Hadith collection that was uh, Muwatta by Imam uh, Malik was actually undertaken in response to a request by a caliph to do so, you see. Mm -hmm. So Malik was under political pressure to, to do this. And uh, the caliph that uh, advised him to do it was, I think, Al-Mansur, the second Abbasid caliph. And before Al-Mansur, there was another caliph. His name was Umar II. He actually ordered the, uh, the collection and, and the recording of the Hadith. Uh, uh, he sent out a general sort of order uh, around his realm for people to do that. So... Um, uh, and he, in fact, according to Tahajabi Rawani, by the way, which is the source of my this information, uh, Umar the second was in fact the first first person who openly publicly claimed that the uh, prohibition of the, uh, the the prophet's prohibition of the recording and narration transmission of hadith was abrogated so this is what umar claimed that uh, mm -hmm. the prophet uh, abrogated the, the his, his original prohibition of the recording and transmission of the hadith and uh, umar uh, had to make this claim i suppose otherwise he could not uh, justify his order for people to start writing down whatever they heard f from the prophet you see mm -hmm. so what the, the reason i mention these two uh, uh, events is to highlight that the collection of the hadith had a political beginning it was done yes. under compulsion from the powers that be and yes. uh, we are told in islam that there is no compulsion in the religion well it looks like there was some compulsion in yes. the collection of the hadith so it was done yes. under duress you might say political yes. duress yes. and so what does that do to the integrity of the collection process when it is not uh, it didn't happen as a result of some kind-hearted old man decided to start collecting the, the what he thought were the sayings of the prophet no he was doing it under orders from the political yes. ruler and you know yeah. what happens to people that disobey orders, yeah? Yes, of course. Why, why did so many Nazi collaborators say after, say after the war that, well, we only followed orders? Yes, right? yes, of course. So I just wanted to highlight the political beginnings of, the, of these yeah. uh, Hadith collections. I think it's a yeah, very important this, point to remember. Thank yeah, you. This, is, this was a, a natural uh, developmental process that followed the political interest rather than the interest on behalf of Al Quran. You see, it's very, it's very plain to see. All right, then. Well, with that being said, dear brother, thank you once again. And I hope to, that uh, the high heaven that we can meet again next week and continue this discussion, inshallah.
Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brother. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi. And thank you too, brother.